Hello everyone and welcome again to uh, the latest installments of our Australian Geometric PD seminar series. Uh, we're going to have Ben Andrews give his third and final talk on two-dimensional Ricci flow. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Um, so this talk will be mostly uh, distinct from the previous two talks, so that the methods are entirely separate. Um, so I want to talk about um, a method that Paul Bryan and I came up with to prove convergence for the Ricci flow on the two sphere for, for any metric. So uh, let me just remind you what the, the result is that we're proving. So uh, if we start with any metric, say G naught, so any smooth metric, um, one is two, uh, then the solution of the normalized Ricci flow is this flow rate of change of metric is uh, minus two Gauss curvature minus one times the metric with that initial condition. So G times zero is our G naught. So that's what I'm calling the 2D normalized Ricci flow. Um, so it exists for all time and converges uh, as t goes to infinity to a constant curvature to uh, you know, g infinity, which is a smooth metric uh, with Gauss curvature identically equal to one. So constant curvature, uh, isometric to the standard metric. Okay, um, okay so that's, that's the result. Um, and I went through in the last lecture kind of the, the, the argument that that Chow and Hamilton used to get that, well, without some of the details at the end. Uh, so today, the, I'm gonna to use it to give a com completely separate proof. It uses uh, the main tool, which we're gonna use is the uh, isoparametric profile. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at the, the isoparametric profile of the evolving metric and try to control that in order to get the convergence result. Uh, and so the, the one, the only really sort of technical estimate that I'm going to use is one which we've covered uh, more generally for the Ricci flow. That's just the smoothing estimates. Um, uh, Ricci flow. So this is not particularly two dimension. This works in, in any dimension. Um, this just says that as long as you have a, a bound on the Curvature. So, in the two-dimensional case, that's just the just the Gauss curvature. Uh, if you have uh, a solution of the two of this normalized Ricci flow, let's say on on some manifold, uh, on some time interval, uh, then uh, again, this is for a solution of normalized Ricci flow, which I wrote down. Then uh, you get bounds on all the higher derivatives of curvature. So, the uh, let's say the jth derivative of k. Uh, measured in the metric at time t would be bounded by some constant which depends only on on j and maybe the dimension dimensions two in our case um, so then you get this bound on the curvature the power j plus two and then uh, a term which is like a constant uh, the same c times t to the power minus j okay so in particular if you stay away from t equals zero then this gives you uniform bounds on all, all higher derivatives. Right? So basically, essentially, the, the upshot is the curvature bound gives you everything. Curvature controls everything under the Ricci flow. Um, all right, so yeah, the, we're going to look at isoparametric profiles. Um, and so the definition of that is like this. So if I take, um, so we're, here we're normalizing. We're assuming we've normalized everything so that the area of the metric at each time is four pi. Right? And then, uh, so then for each value of the area, so each a positive but less than four pi, we can uh, look at the least perimeter for all regions of that area. Okay, so this would be the inf over uh, 
size of the boundary of omega measured with respect to G. Uh, this is over all subsets of, in this case, S2. Um, and I don't need to be, in the two-dimensional case, you don't have to be too careful about what the what this sort of set of domains is that you're working over. So I can just take these to be smoothly bounded. Um, uh, and the sets we're working over are ones which have area, again, measured with respect to G, equal to our given number A. Okay, so we're minimizing perimeter over all, all sets of a fixed area. And that defines this isoparameter profile. Uh, and so what's quite easy to show in the two-dimensional case is that for any value of the area, there exists uh, an isoparametric region. So um, there exists an omega um, achieving the inf, right? um, And again, with smooth boundary. Um, achieving. So in other words, that um, it has area equal to A and perimeter equal to the isoparametric profile of A. Um, all right, so um, that's really all I need to use in, in the argument, just the existence of this uh, isoparametric region. Um, so for example, I mean, some of the cases we can work out relatively easily. So on, on R2, um, then we'd get, okay, here the area is not four pi, but apart from that, we still get an isoparametric profile. If I fix the area, then of course the minimizer, um, so here G is just the Euclidean metric, the delta IJ, the uh, minimizer is just the ball. And so the perimeter for fixed area works out to be square root of four pi times the area. Um, so uh, that's straightforward. Of course, you just prove this in many different ways. But for example, by symmetrization, Steiner symmetrization would give you this result. Uh, on S2 with a standard metric, which is more relevant to what we're doing here. Um, so G is the, the round metric, or just the inclusion in, into R3 in the usual way, if you like. Uh, so here, again, by symmetrization, you can get that the uh, isoparametric profile is achieved on spherical caps. Um, so region that looks like this. Uh, and you can work out that the isoparametric profile, so given, given a, a spherical cap, it's just determined by, let's say, the, the uh, angle to the pole here, uh, theta. Uh, and it's not too hard to work. So of course the length here uh, in terms of theta, this is just exponential coordinates in the sphere. So the length would be uh, two pi sine theta. Uh, and the area is just given by integrating that from, from zero to theta, right? So this would be uh, two pi one minus cosine theta. All right, so then uh, what's the, the formula relating these? Well, if I take L squared, that's four pi squared sine squared theta. And I can write that as four pi, uh, four pi squared one minus cos squared theta. Okay, and the, so the one minus cos theta is gonna give me an A, and then I go one plus cos theta here. Uh, so that would be, so I get a two pi one minus cos theta, which is an A. And then I get a two pi times one plus cos theta, which is just uh, four pi minus A. Okay, so that's the sort of isoparametric uh, identity here. So uh, that gives me the, the length of the perimeter for a given spherical cap. And so now if I just, uh, that, that now gives me, I take square root, that gives me this isoparametric profile. So it's, uh, square root of a times four pi minus a. Okay, so it's, as you can see, so maybe it's better to think about it in terms of i squared. Um, so it's four pi a 
uh, minus a squared. So all I've done is, is add that quadratic term to the isobaric profile for, for the uh, Euclidean case. Um, okay, so yeah. Um, so what can the isoparameter profile tell us? Well, um, one thing which it would tell us is if our metric had a sort of a, a narrow waist like this, right? So if I had uh, something like this with a narrow thing here, then the perimeter of this region here would be very small, but the area would be large. And so you'd get a, a very small, this would be a small uh, i g of a for some n, right? So this, this is area a. So controlling the isoparametric profile from below is going to give us some kind of control on the you know the global geometry, the global structure of this thing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of one one motivation for doing this. But as we'll see, that uh, the way that we end up using this is actually not going to be anything. We we won't make any mention of the the effect that it has on the change of shape. It's a little bit surprising the way it works out, but this is sort of a motivation for looking at the profiles to begin with. Um, all right, so in the spherical, in the sphere case, the isoparameter regions are regions are very nice. They're balls, uh, just spherical caps here. This example I've drawn here, the isoparameter region is, is also a ball, but things can be a lot worse. Uh, you know, if I take uh, a sphere which is a bit nastier, like some kind of caricature of a COVID virus or something like this, <laughs> um, then, um, well, here you'd get, you know, if I take the area to be roughly the area of these blobs at the end here, then an isoparametric region might be a union of these, uh, these parts here. And so in particular, you could get uh, regions which are not simply connected. So, um, so isoparametric regions uh, can be, uh, non simply connected for a start, and they can be. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, should point it here. If you have an isoparametric region, then its complement is also an isoparametric region, right? Because it uh, has the same perimeter, and uh, it, you know, for, so for fixed area, if you're minimizing the perimeter of of a region, you're also minimizing the perimeter of its of its complement. So the complement of an isoparametric region is also isoparametric. So in this picture, the complement would be like a sphere with some four holes in it. And so it has you know, higher, higher genus. Uh, so it can be non-simply connected. Uh, and it can also be, be disconnected. Um, so the, the topology can be quite complicated in general. Um, all right, so um, what's gonna be important for us is understanding the isoparametric profile for small areas. So, um, well, for small areas, of course, any manifold looks like Euclidean space. Uh, and so the isoparametric profile should be like the, the isoparametric profile of Euclidean space. Um, what's important for us is kind of the next term in that expansion. So let me just write down a little lemma here. Um, okay, so it's, well, as we saw up here, it's kind of easy to work with I squared rather than I. So the, um, if I take the isoparametric profile for a metric G uh, as a function of area A, where A, where A is approaching zero, then, okay, so the first term should be four pi A. That's just the Euclidean one. Uh, and, so I claim that the next term, um, and maybe not surprising in view of the sphere example up there, is that here we get a coefficient which is the soup over m of Gauss curvature of g times a squared. Okay, and then we have a remainder term which is you know, small compared to a squared. Um, probably do it. I think it's like a, you could probably say a to the five halves or something like that. That would be not too difficult. Um, yeah, so the, the crucial thing here is that the next term in the expansion actually uh, is determined by the maximum of curvature. Okay, so why is that? Uh, let me just, so um, let me at least sort of sketch why that would be true. Um, if I look in exponential coordinates, 
Um, so if I so let's fix a point, some uh, you know point in the manifold, um, and then look at uh, exponential coordinates from there. Well, so what I'll get is that the the metric um, around that point, um, I can bound above by um, a constant curvature metric. Um, so this would be, yeah, let me write it as, um, this would be a constant curvature metric. So this would be S2 of uh, one over root K of P, right? So Gauss curvature scales like distance squared. So it corresponds to the, the sphere of radius one over the square root of K as constant curvature k. Um, so, and here, uh, this is so uh, immediately near the, the quadratic approximation, in other words, the metric is exactly this constant curvature metric. Uh, the, the deviation from that occurs due to grading of curvature terms, and they would come up at the order of radius cubed, right? So. So I get one plus constant times R cubed. And here I'll get, again, bounded below by uh, the same kind of thing. So um, so this would be, let's say, one minus C R cubed. Okay, so this kind of inequality, so it's sort of sandwiched between uh, you know, multiples of this constant curvature metric. Okay, so then if I just use this and I, uh, I uh, um, plug in uh, the ball of radius r about p. Um, well, again, ball of radius r, this would be, let's say, with respect to the, uh, let me call this g bar, right? So this is the constant curvature metric is g bar. So the ball of radius r, um, oh, actually, it's just the ball in exponential coordinates, yeah, um, in whichever metric, since I'm Make using that correspondence uh, into the isoparameter profile. Uh, in other words, the, the isoparameter profile is an inf, so in particular, it's less than or equal to what I get by plugging into those balls. That tells me that the isoparameter profile of A is less than uh, what I would get in the in the constant curvature metric, which is exactly uh, k of p a squared, and then I get an error term. Uh, which is what works out to be um, plus some constant times a to the um, five halves, I think in that case. This comes from about from the, we're taking the square root in, in the, sorry, this is I, I squared, not I here. Yeah. Um, okay, so that gives me a bound in one direction. Um, and the bound in the other direction, uh, Again, comes from the fact that if I have any any uh, any small region, then I can comp compare the uh, the perimeter and the area with respect to G to the perimeter and area with respect to G bar. And there's a, a simple comparison, right? So, um, so the reverse you have to work a little bit harder, but uh, plug and uh, any region, any so uh, any small region. Uh, into i g, and you just compare the uh, the length of perimeter and area to what you would get with g bar uh, using the this um, this comparison here, right? Uh, and that gives you the reverse inequality. So it's it's really just saying that near a point, the the metric is well approximated by that constant curvature metric with the with Gauss curvature at p. Uh, okay, so that's great. So what does that mean? Uh, what's really nice about that is that if I can control the isoparametric uh, profile well enough, so let me write this as a kind of corollary. Um, if I know that the isoparametric profile of a given metric uh, um, well, let's say I squared, uh, you know, minus four pi a um, uh, 
uh, is greater than or equal to uh, minus a, a constant times a squared um, as a approaches zero, uh, then uh, you can conclude that the Gauss curvature of G is bounded by C. Right? So that's, if we can get good enough control on the isoparametric profile, then we can deduce a bound on the curvature. Right? And so as I mentioned way back here, these smoothing estimates tell us that a bound on curvature is kind of what we need, right? So that we automatically get control on all higher derivatives once we control the curvature. All right, so that's the game. And uh, so the next thing is how do we actually control the, uh, the uh, isoparametric profile? So Ben, yeah. once, you have, once you have smooth conversions, why is it clear that it's the round metric in the limit? Uh, it's not a priori, right? So at, uh, at the okay. moment, okay. That, that would be enough to give us long time existence. Right. Uh, okay. Unless I happen to know that this C is one, that would give me Gauss curvature less than or equal to one, but Gauss Bonnet would say that, in fact, the Gauss curvature has the integral. Right. Yeah, so that would, that's actually what happens. So we'll, we'll get it, such a strong curvature control that it really gives exponential convergence down to one. Um, so that was kind of unexpected that, what, that we get such a strong uh, curvature bound from this, but it works out nicely. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, so how to control, how to control the isoparametric profile. Uh, so this is, um, all right. Um, well, let's ask the question. Um, so suppose that for the initial metric, we have uh, for all regions omega or smoothly bounded regions omega, um, we have that the perimeter is greater than or equal to um, some function of the area, right? Um, um, okay, so this is with respect to the initial metric G naught and this function phi, I'm going to take to depend on area and time, right? So then, in other words, really, I'm just choosing choosing a phi at the time zero to be something less than the isometric profile of the of the initial metric. Um, and really, the question is, um, for which functions phi can this inequality be preserved? Um, so I want to. In other words, try and derive a kind of maximum principle for this inequality. Um, but in, there's a kind of well, there's a complication here, which is this is this. Uh, uh, so in other words, the inequality is a function of a region omega and a time t. Right? And it's just the this difference. So the perimeter of omega measured with respect to the metric at time t and minus this function of the area, again, measured with respect to t and t. So I can sort of choose it. I'm going to choose this function phi to evolve with respect to t in some way and try to arrange that uh, we have a maximum principle, right? So in other words, that if z, z is initially greater than or equal to zero, it will never become negative. Okay, um, so uh, let me make the simplifying assumption. So Assume that um, Z is strictly less than zero uh, on, so uh, um, yeah, on area on um, omegas which have positive area, let's say, well, positive in less than four pi. Right? Um, so then. Um, if I, as long as I choose phi to be, you know, continuous, um, it should be smooth, let's say, then it's not hard to show that the isoparametric profile, so G is, is smooth in time. The, uh, so yeah, so one thing which I claim, but I won't go through the pr detailed proof of is that the isoparametric profile with respect to G of T uh, is continuous. So continuous here in, a and in T. Okay, so if I vary the area, it's, it's continuous. And if I vary the 
the time t, it's also continuous. So that's really straightforward to check. Um, so that means uh, if the if uh, z uh, is not always positive. then there will exist a first time. There's a first time. Um, okay, I need to make one more assumption in order to make that true. So I want to assume, um, yeah, let me put that as some. So I want to assume, um, so first of all, phi is smooth. Um, assuming we have the strict inequality at time zero. And the other thing I want to assume is that uh, phi as I go towards zero, uh, I want to sort of put an assumption which guarantees you can't have equality happening for, for very small areas. So let's, to do that, I'm going to assume that phi uh, is like some constant times uh, root four pi a, and c is something less than one. Okay. So that would mean, because we know the isoprenage profile for any smooth metric is asymptotic to square root of four pi a, so if I put this C less than one here, that means that at least for small areas, we cannot ever have equality happening. Okay, so under that assumption, uh, there will be a first time uh, T zero greater than zero and uh, an area A naught, which will be strictly positive and less than four pi, uh, such that Z first reaches zero. Okay, uh, so and, uh, Right. Um, in other words, we have for all omega z omega t is greater than or equal to zero for um, t up to t naught. And then there exists some, let's call it omega naught, such that z is equal to zero. So omega naught t naught is equal to zero. Okay, so that's what we can deduce. And now I want to get a contradiction uh, to that ever happening by somehow you know, using the ideas of the maximum principle. So it's somehow a contradiction between the time derivative and the, the uh, spatial derivatives, whatever that means here. Uh, all right, so what can we say about this? Um, all right, so the spatial derivatives, well, here we're looking at a function which is on a space of regions, right? So this is some huge infinite dimensional space. Um, I can look at what happens when I vary the set omega in some direction, right? So let's consider variations. Now just for fixed T, right? Um, of omega naught. So to do this, um, I'm gonna vary the boundary curve, right? So I'll take, um, in other words, let's take a map sigma, which takes boundary omega naught uh, across some interval of uh, you know, perturbation parameter uh, into S2. Okay, and I want that the uh, sigma x0 is x. So you start off just at boundary omega zero, and uh, then, all right, so the picture is, you know, we've got our uh, S2. Here's our omega naught, some region like this. Here's our boundary curve. And so uh, the, we'll just push this, this boundary curve out to get uh, a new region. So this would be sigma at some time, uh, some parameter. Uh, what am I gonna call this? Say S, I guess, um, here. And the speed at which this moves, I'm gonna call F, right? So I'm gonna take, uh, D by D S sigma um, U S is going to be a function F uh, along the boundary times the normal. At, uh, at that point, right? So it just keeps moving out in the normal direction. Uh, so for example, I mean, the easy way to do this is to take uh, sigma U S is just the exponential map from uh, from the point U on the boundary uh, 
for S uh, F of U N of U. Okay, so it's just firing off geodesics from the boundary in this normal direction with the speed determined by F. Right? So these will these will uh, give me new boundary curves which bound new regions omega S. Okay, so take uh, omega S to be the region bounded by. This boundary curve, so sigma time s. Okay, so uh, then we can work out how the perimeter and the area vary, right? So d by the s of the area of omega s. Well, that's easy to compute. So I'm just pushing out at each point with speed f in the normal direction, uh, and so I'm just adding on sort of a strip of width f along here, and that gives me integral around boundary omega naught. Um, well, actually, let's do this for each s. So boundary omega s, and I go f times the uh, arc length element du. Yeah. Um, okay, and the perimeter. Um, okay, so here I'm moving in the normal direction with speed f. The the rate of change of the arc length element is going to be just f times curvature du. Okay, so we put these together, then I get d by ds of z omega s. This is all happening at time t naught. Uh, will be okay. So what do I get? I get the integral boundary omega s f k du. So here I'm differentiating. Uh, where's my z? This function up here, right? So differentiate this. So that's the perimeter. And now here I differentiate phi. So I get a phi prime, meaning the derivative in the first argument, times the rate of change of area, which is uh, integral boundary omega s of f. Okay, so that's not too bad. I get integral on the boundary f times k minus phi prime. U. Okay, so when when s equals zero, um, uh, we're at a clearly at a minimum of z, right? So it's it's uh, z is greater than or equal to zero, but equal to zero for s equals zero, and so I get this derivative with respect to s is zero, no matter what f is. Um, so d by the s z equals zero for all f, and that tells me that k is identically equal to phi prime. So if constant curvature, constant geodesic curvature along the boundary curve, and what's more we have, we know what the curvature is, it's just equal to phi prime at that value of a. Okay, uh, I need to compute the second derivative. So um, the, again, as uh, a function of s here, the picture is we've got z, which we know is greater than zero, but equal to zero, um, for s equals zero. So we have also that the second derivative at s equals zero is greater than or equal to zero. That's the stability inequality. Um, so I want to compute the second derivative uh, of z um, at omega s time t zero. And here we only want this at s equals zero. And also here I'm going to choose. Um, just f equals one, right? So I'm gonna take for this computation, the only one I need to compute is actually the case where I'm moving just with constant speed. Um, okay, so that's easy. So I need to take, uh, I just differentiate this expression that I got for the first derivative, this one. Uh, so this will be, and this time f is one. So this is integral uh, d omega s uh, k du and minus phi prime times the perimeter. We already know how to differentiate the perimeter. Um, okay. Um, now, of course, you can do this. You can work out the how the curvature varies. But there's a in the two-dimensional case, I can make this really easy for myself by using the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Uh, so Gauss-Bonnet theorem says that if I have any region omega, that integral over omega of Gauss curvature, 
integrated respect to area element of the metric plus the integral on the boundary of omega of the geodesic curvature is just equal to, well, two pi times the Euler characteristic of the region. Right? So if I plug that in here, this integral of Gauss curvature, I can replace by two pi Euler characteristic of omega. Now this is just a constant, of course, that's not changing under this variation, uh, minus integral omega Gauss curvature with respect to area, and now minus phi prime integral of, or just the perimeter, yeah. Okay, so now that's becomes very easy to differentiate. In particular, this first term is just gives derivative of zero, that's just constant. And the second term is just an integral over the interior of Gauss curvature. So if I'm moving with constant speed, I'm just gonna get the integral around the perimeter of Gauss curvature, du. Okay, and when the last term is easy to, easy to compute. So I get one term where I differentiate the perimeter and we know how to do that. That just gives integral of curvature. And the other term where I differentiate the phi prime, that'll be minus phi double prime uh, integral. So the rate of change of area is the perimeter again. So I get this perimeter squared. Okay, so all of that is, is rather straightforward to compute. Um, so that's the, the inequality now is that uh, d2 by dS squared of z at s equals zero is greater than or equal to zero. So that's the first inequality that I've got. Um, okay, so in other words, I can rewrite that now as saying the integral uh, around the boundary of omega naught of the Gauss curvature of the background metric is less than or equal to, okay, now if I look a bit closer at these other terms, I can also simplify them a bit. Uh, so I get minus uh, phi prime integral of Gauss, integral of geodesic curvature on the boundary. Well, geodesic curvature is equal to phi prime, right? So this is what we know, this identity here. So this is just phi prime times the perimeter and the perimeter is equal to phi, right? Because that equals zero. So this is just phi, uh, yeah, what do I get? So I get phi prime and times phi phi prime. So it's minus phi phi prime squared. Okay, it's using this, this identity for the curvature. And then in the second term, uh, these, these perimeters are just feet, right? So I get a minus phi squared phi double prime. Okay, so there's my, my first inequality. All right, so this is, by, this is essentially like the spatial variations. It's like computing the second derivative of our function. Um, and the, okay, so the other thing I wanna compute is the time derivative. So d by dt of z, now this I'll just compute on this one set omega naught, okay? But now with respect to t, and we're computing this at t equals t naught. Uh, okay, so, and this is under the normalized Ricci flow. Um, right, so what are we computing here? So it's ddt of the uh, perimeter. Well, let me write that as integral around the boundary of omega naught uh, of, du, this is arc length element measured with respect to the metric. So this is G uh, T, okay. Uh, and then this is minus phi. Now phi depends on the integral of omega naught uh, with respect to area coming from G at time T. And phi also depends on T. Okay, so everything here, you can, you can do this time derivative uh, without any problem. Uh, the set is fixed, right? So all that's changing here is the metric uh, and the metric is changing conformally uh, by factor two times K minus one. So the rate of change of an arc length element that's like, that is a square root of the metric applied to some fixed vector is just gonna be uh, K minus one, uh, so sorry, G is, Rate of change of the metric is minus two K minus one times G, right? So here I'm gonna get, this thing here is determined by the square root of a metric component. So it'll be minus integral boundary omega naught Gauss curvature minus one du. Okay, uh, now differentiating phi in the first argument will give me a phi prime. I'm just, that's phi primes are just derivatives in the first argument here. And, um, 
the rate of change of the area. That means I'm integrating it over omega naught, the determinant of the metric, and that will change uh, at rate uh, square root of the determinant of the metric. Sorry, so it's 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 um, homogeneous of degree one in the metric. Uh, that will change at rate uh, minus two integral omega naught Gauss curvature minus one, the area. Okay, and then I have to differentiate v in the time direction. So that's just the d phi dt here. So how the function phi itself depends on t. All right, good. So uh, now all of those are relatively easy to work out. So I get the integral boundary omega naught k. Okay, and the important thing is that's the same term as we got in the spatial variation. Uh, I get a plus integral of one, which is just the perimeter. So that's a phi. Um, then let's see, I get the minus one is going to give me an area element. Uh, so that would be uh, what I get a minus two uh, phi prime times area A. And then I get a plus two phi prime integral Gauss curvature over omega naught. And then a minus e phi dt. Okay, uh, now here we can use Gauss Bonnet again. So this this term here, I can rewrite using Gauss Bonnet. Okay, so what am I going to get? So I still have this integral over the boundary of Gauss curvature plus phi minus two phi prime a. Um, and now this becomes a two phi prime. Uh, What's that? So it's two pi Euler characteristic of omega naught uh, minus integral boundary omega naught of curvature. Okay, I still have e phi dt. Okay, and again, curvature we know. So what we end up with here is minus integral Gauss curvature plus phi minus two phi prime a uh, plus four pi phi prime. Euler characteristic. Um, now this will be a minus, so the integral k is a phi phi prime, right? So k is phi prime, perimeter is phi. So this will be a minus two uh, phi phi prime squared minus d phi dt. Okay, and there we go. So uh, now what do we know about this? So we know that z is greater than zero for t less than t naught that decreases down to zero at t equals t naught. So this time derivative is less than or equal to zero at t equals t naught. So there's the second inequality. So uh, again, I can rearrange that to say that integral of Gauss curvature on the perimeter of omega naught is greater than or equal to all the rest of this stuff, right? So uh, phi minus two phi prime a plus four pi phi prime Euler characteristic uh, minus two phi phi prime squared minus d phi dt. Right, okay. Now the beautiful thing is that if I put inequalities one and two together, then I can get a chain of inequalities which now almost doesn't depend on the geometry at all. So let's see what we get. Um, so, okay. so. So this is greater than or equal to all this stuff here, and it's less than or equal to uh, minus phi phi prime squared minus phi squared phi double prime. Uh, and so if I rearrange that, the inequality that I'll get is um, this one. So uh, d phi dt is greater than or equal to um, okay, so I get a phi squared phi double prime. Um, that's from uh, in inequality one up here. Yeah. Uh, then inequality one, I had a minus phi phi prime squared, but that I this is counted by the minus two phi phi prime squared on the other side. So this would be end up with a minus phi phi prime squared, uh, and then I get a four pi Euler characteristic of omega naught 
at minus 2a phi prime plus phi. Okay, so that's the upshot of all that. If z decreases down to zero, then this function phi must satisfy this inequality. Conversely, if I can choose phi, right, I sort of free to choose the phi, right? So if I can choose phi to satisfy the reverse inequality, let's say a strict reverse inequality, then that tells me that this can't happen. So, okay, so idea is to choose phi such that the phi dt is less than all the stuff on the right hand side. Okay, and now let's look more closely at the stuff on the right hand side. So, remember, okay, so phi remember is a function of two variables. It's a function of the area A and the time t, right? So, and this is just, so just think of this, it's nothing to do with the geometry now, it's just a function of two variables. So this time derivative is fine, we can compute that. This is fine, this is fine. Everything here depends only on those two variables except for this one thing, right? So the only possible problem here in choosing this phi is, is this term here, uh, which depends on the Euler characteristic. Okay, and the trouble is I wanna choose, so I wanna choose the phi to be less than that. The Euler characteristic could in principle be very negative, right? So this example that I drew up here with the COVID virus, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, multiple, the Euler characteristic of this, not the one I drew, but the complement would be, would be negative, right? If I put lots of spikes on the COVID, then you get a very negative answer. So that's the one uh, problem here. Um, uh, so what we need to do somehow is control that Euler characteristic, okay? Um, and we know that's not always possible, but um, we can still, do something here. Okay, the claim is if uh, phi, if I just fix t, okay, so here everything is happening at a time t naught. So if uh, phi at time t naught is strictly concave, then uh, the Euler characteristic of omega naught is one which I mean, it's a disk type, a simply connected region, which is uh, really what we want. I mean, that's what you get in the sphere case. So that's, uh, if we wanna get something that's somehow sharp, then that's what you would hope to be true. Um, okay, so let's prove that. So we know we couldn't prove this in general if we just wanna prove things about the isoparentric profile, but here phi is not necessarily the isoparentric profile. There's just some lower bound for the isoparentric profile. And we're kind of free to choose this. Uh, and the claim is if we choose it to make, to be strictly concave, then we do get this information about the topology of the ice, of the, of the region that achieves that. All right, so proof. So uh, in the sphere, let me just point out, it is enough to, to show it's uh, uh, oil characteristic is one. Uh, what I need to show is that uh, omega naught and its complement are connected, right? So if I had any region, uh, uh, which had, well, first of all, I mean, there's two possible issues here that uh, we could have a, a multiple connected components for omega naught and that would change the order characteristic there as well. Um, we could make it large, so that's in principle not a bad thing, but, but the other problem is that uh, omega Naught would could be multiply connected, but that would mean that the complement was disconnected. Okay, so if I can rule out omega naught and its its complement being disconnected, then I I guarantee that the Euler characteristic is one. Um, all right, so how do we do that? So, uh, and it's the same. Okay, so suppose omega naught is not connected, uh, and since Let's see, omega naught and its complement are both, both isoparamic regions. So if I give a proof for omega naught, then the same proof will work for the complement. So, uh, so that tells me that uh, omega naught is a union of two things. So let's call them omega one plus omega two. And uh, you know, the, these would both be positive area, right? Otherwise I can just throw them away. Um, so, well, what does that say? So, and then also because the boundaries are smooth, right? So that these are actually manifolds with boundary uh, embedded. That means I can't have 
uh, any part of the boundaries which are in common. So the boundary of omega naught is just the union of the boundaries of the two. So in particular, the perimeter is just the sum of the perimeters of those two regions. Okay, so now I get a chain of inequalities. Um, so we know since z equals zero, um, z of omega naught p naught equals zero, that tells me that the perimeter of omega naught is equal to phi of area omega naught, p naught. And now that's equal to phi of the sum omega one plus omega two, t naught. Uh, and the perimeter is equal to the sum of the perimeters. So this is uh, boundary omega one plus boundary omega two. Right now, so far everything is equalities, but now I can use uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, we have the inequality on Z for all regions. So if I imply the inequality for omega one and omega two, then I get that this perimeter of omega one is at least as great as phi of area omega one. Okay, and similarly the perimeter of phi two, I get that that's at least as big as phi omega two T naught. Uh, okay, and now um, I claim that this, uh, by strict concavity, is less than phi of omega one plus phi of omega two. Okay, so uh, well, that's not too hard to see. So here. Uh, well, I need to assume uh, also that phi of zero T naught equals zero, right? but that's something which we'll always assume. So uh, here we are, here's zero, you know, four pi. Our phi is some concave function like this. Um, here would be, uh, you know, let's say A1 plus A2. That's if this is uh, A1 and this is A2. And so over here we'd have A1, and A2 and right. So let's see, concavity gives me two simple things. First of all is that uh, the phi of A1, that's this height here is bigger than this line. Uh, sorry, I should be drawing it here. Yeah, uh, phi of A1 is bigger than this height here, which is, uh, a1 over A1 plus A2, phi of A1 plus A2, and same for A2, right? So um, A2 on A1 plus A2, phi of A1 plus A2, just by strict concavity. So these are strict inequalities here. That's the strict strict concavity. And so I just add those up. So if I add those, then I get exactly this inequality up here. Okay, so that would be, that, that's a contradiction. So we can't have uh, disconnected omega naught. And for the same reason, we can't have disconnected complement of omega naught because I can split that up in the same way. Okay, so now we're really in business because the, uh, it means I only need to choose, so, okay, theorem. Um, if uh, isoparametric profile of G naught, uh, is bigger than phi uh, times zero, sorry. And uh, d phi dt is less than uh, phi squared phi double prime minus phi phi prime squared, et cetera, the same, the same set of inequalities. Oh, except I should write that out because now the difference is, um, that we know that last term here. Uh, so the other terms are these ones. Sorry, it's not scrolling for some reason. Okay, so uh, these were the terms, but now instead of this four pi times Euler characteristic, I know the Euler characteristic is one. So this is just four pi minus two a. Oops times phi prime. 
Okay, and now uh, this is this is beautiful. So this is just an explicit differential inequality that I need to choose phi to satisfy. There's no geometry anymore. Right? So it's just I have to find a function of two variables that satisfies this inequality. Uh, then, yeah. So then we get a contradiction to the, to the previous argument. Right? So the previous argument said if z ever came down to zero, then I would have the reverse inequality, and so we, this would rule that out. Uh, so then that would imply that the i g t is bigger than phi at time t for all t greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that looks quite promising. So the next question is uh, how to choose phi. How can I construct a phi that satisfies that inequality? Um, well, uh, in fact, you can can understand that differential inequality quite easily. You can convert, if you just play around with it, you can convert this into a logarithmic porous medium inequality together with the scaling. And so you can you can plug into the explicit solutions that come from porous medium equations. Um, I'm not going to do that because there's a beautiful geometric way to construct the thing that we need. Um, and that goes like this. So I'm going to relate it, you know, it came from Ritchie flow. I'm going to produce produce uh, the thing we not want from from the Ritchie flow. All right, so here it is. Let uh, let's say we have uh, not phi tilde. So let g tilde um, be a. So again, this is going to be a solution of the normalized Ritchie flow on S two. Uh, and I want to assume that. Um, it is axially symmetric. Okay, so think of this, you know, as a function on the standard sphere. I can assume that it's a, you know, it's a function of uh, um, distance to the pole, for example. Um, and let's also say that's probably not really necessary, but also uh, and reflection symmetric uh, in the sense that I want the two poles to look the same. So, yeah, so let me draw the picture. Um, so it's going to be a sphere, but um, axially symmetric. So we've got this axis of rotation here. So pole at each end, something like this. And I want the reflection which sends one pole to the other to be an isometry as well. Uh, so that means we have some equator here and these, um, and there's a, so there's a, a rotation symmetry this way, which is uh, isometries. Um, okay, so um, then I'm going to just take, uh, okay, so let's take omega s to be really these family of, of circles given by the orbit of the rotation. To, uh, so the, well, the, the ball of uh, radius s. And so that might as well be with the uh, at time t naught, right? Some fixed time t naught from a pole. Uh, the time only affects the parameterization. They'll be the same family of curves, right? It's just the, the curves given by, uh, well, if I think of this as a metric on the standard sphere, then these really are just the spherical caps, these omega s's, right? but possibly with a different parameterization in s um, from uh, a pole. Okay, so. In other words, each of these omega s is, is invariant under the rotation. Um, and yeah, so in particular by symmetry, they will have constant geodesic curvature. Okay, and then uh, we'll let uh, L of s and t be just the, the uh, um, perimeter measured with g of t. And A of S and T is the area. Um, again, measured with the metric at time T. So, well, you know, the, the omega S's are, are nested strictly. So the area is a strictly increasing function of the S. Um, and so now I can essentially parameterize by the area. Okay, so now I'm going to define uh, phi of S and T to be the length at given area 
for this family with respect to the metric at time t, which just means I take the uh, function L for fixed t and compose that with the uh, inverse of the function A at time t. Okay, so that's that's the function phi, right? So I claim that this is going to satisfy everything we need. Okay, so then we know by construction we've got uh, Z for this for this flow, this G tilde. I say these should be G tilde. So yeah. everything here is G tilde. This is in this sort of this is like a model solution which I'm going to use to construct the function phi. Um, okay, so Z. Um, um, Omega s t is identically zero with this choice of phi by construction. Right? So I've, I've really chosen phi to be exactly the function which makes this z equal zero. Um, okay, so in particular, that tells me that for all s and t, I get uh, the z ds is zero. Okay, and that's computation like I gave before says that uh, this is integral over boundary s of k minus v prime du and here we know that k is constant so uh, that means k is equal to v prime right um, so it's constant curvature v prime and I also know that the second derivative is zero so d2z ds squared uh, at any s is zero and so the same computation as before uh, says that is uh, minus integral d omega s Gauss curvature g tilde time t du again g tilde time t uh, minus phi phi prime squared minus phi squared phi double prime. And so I just get equality in that second variation inequality. Uh, and I also get equality in the time derivative. So um, dz dt. So I can I go back through the time derivative uh, computation, and it's uh, that will give me the identity. So this was uh, minus integral boundary of the region Gauss curvature um, du uh, plus phi minus two a phi prime. Then I get a four pi times Euler characteristic, but here the Euler characteristic is clearly one because these are just the spherical caps. Um, four pi phi prime uh, minus two phi phi prime squared minus d phi dt. Okay, so I really get exactly the same things as I had before, but this time I'm getting them with equality. Right? So in particular, that means I get equality in the eventual eventual uh, combination of things. So in other words, if I take these two inequalities and eliminate the integrals of gas curvature, then I get exactly what I want. Well, uh, I get d phi dt equals uh, phi squared phi double prime minus phi phi prime squared, uh, basically everything we wanted up here. Right. Where am I? This, yeah. Um, yeah, plus four pi minus two a phi prime plus phi. Okay, so the construction is kind of trivial. Right? We, I don't actually have to do any any PDE or solve any equations or anything. I just take okay. Suppose we have a solution of a rotationally symmetric solution of Ricci flow that will give me a solution of this of this inequality. All right. So what else did I need? I needed the v to be concave, uh, but from this one here, I can arrange that. So so if I assume that the Gauss curvature of G tilde is positive, then this uh, um, this inequality here would tell me that um, phi squared phi double prime plus phi phi prime squared would be less than zero, and that implies that phi double prime is less than zero. So that gives me the concavity. So, so now, now what I need is a rotationally symmetric solution of, of Ricci flow with positive Gauss curvature. Um, and 
well, then I also needed a strict inequality rather than this equality here. So now I'm going to just uh, take, say, phi epsilon uh, a and t. I'll let that be 1 minus epsilon times phi a and t. OK, and well, what happens there? So that means um, I get d by dt of phi epsilon. Well, I'm just multiplying by 1 minus epsilon. So I get you know, 1 minus epsilon times everything on the right-hand side. Uh, so 1 minus epsilon times phi squared phi double prime minus phi phi prime squared. Now, the last two terms are just linear in phi. So uh, when I multiply by the 1 minus epsilon, this is just going to go through into the, this will be a phi epsilon prime plus phi epsilon. Right? The ones at the front are not homogeneous, but these things are, this group of terms here is negative. Right? So this is less than 0. And so what I want to get the phi epsilon is to replace this 1 minus epsilon by a 1 minus epsilon cubed. right? But that means the inequality goes the right way. So this is now uh, less than um, phi epsilon squared phi epsilon double prime minus phi epsilon phi epsilon prime squared plus those other terms. Okay, in other words, I get the strict inequality that I need. Okay, so what the upshot is that uh, uh, if I have that that solution of Ricci flow, then uh, if I know that the isomparametric profile of my initial metric um, uh, is greater than or equal to sorry, uh, phi at time zero, uh, well, then that means it's strictly greater than or equal to phi epsilon time zero. And maybe that's, what, that's the assumption I had to make, that at time zero I had a strict inequality. Uh, and then what we've just shown says that the isoparent profile at time t would remain strictly bigger than uh, phi epsilon at time t. But now if I let epsilon go to zero, that means that I get isoparent profile greater than or equal to phi at time t for all t greater than or equal to zero. Oops. Okay. Uh, right, so what do we have to do now? Um, that gives me a beautiful result as long as I can find a solution of, of Ricci flow, uh, which is actually symmetric, positive Gauss curvature, and where I have that initial comparison between the isoparentry profiles. All right, oh, well, luckily there is such a thing. Okay, so this is the, uh, well, okay, it goes by many names, right? This is the King Rosenau. Um, and well, depending which sort of literature field you're working in. So it's, it's I think, first found by uh, King and then later independently by Rosenau in the context of logarithmic porous medium equations. Uh, but it was also found independently around about the same time by two uh, theoretical physicists, uh, Fatev and Zamologikov. Zamolog uh, of in the context of string theory and uh, things like that. So this is the fact that that Ricci flow turns up as the the one loop approximation to the world line flow in string theory, um, and it's also often called the sausage model. Okay, so this is an explicit solution of a Ricci flow on the sphere. Uh, so G. Mm, uh, well, okay, let me write it this way. So G, uh, X, Y, T. So this is on a cylinder. Um, in fact, an infinite cylinder. So this is the X variable here. Uh, and Y is going to be the variable around here. Uh, this is to be thought of as conformal. The cylinder is conformal to the sphere without the two poles. Right? So this is, uh, with it, that conformal identification, this is the metric on a sphere. Uh, and it's given explicitly now by 
uh, this formula. So it's sinh of uh, e to the minus 2t divided by 2 e to the minus 2t times hyperbolic cosine of x. Right? So x is somehow here the, uh, the uh, altitude on the cylinder. Or the, uh, and then plus hyperbolic cosine of e to the minus 2t, which looks kind of horrendous. But the, the exponentials here come from the fact that you're changing from Ricci flow to normalized Ricci flow. So it's converting time to, to e to the minus 2t. Uh, and the rest is the, the original king Rosenau solution of this porous medium equation. So, um, OK, so it's explicit. Uh, geometrically, this looks like. Sorry, Ben. Um... Yeah. Oh, sorry, this is not a metric yet. So this is uh, dx squared plus dy squared. Sorry. Yep. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that make more sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so in other words, it's conformal to the standard metric on, on the cylinder and therefore also to the, to the standard metric on the sphere. Um, OK, so this is rotationally symmetric, has positive gas curvature. So I can construct from this the corresponding phi, right? So the phi, you can actually write down from this explicitly, though it's maybe not very enlightening, but I'll do it anyway. Um, four pi square root, I get sinh of uh, a e to the minus two t on four pi times sinh of uh, four pi minus a on four pi e to the minus two t divided by sinh e to the minus 2t times e to the minus 2t, OK, which looks horrendous. But if you look at what we really care about is the asymptotics as a goes to 0. And that looks like, well, let me write it uh, this way. So phi squared a t, if I look at just for small areas, this is 4 pi a minus e to the minus 2t cosh uh, e to the minus 2t a squared plus order a cubed as a goes to zero. OK. Um, all right. So now the geometry of, of the uh, this sausage model, well, as t goes to plus infinity, it's a sphere. It, it becomes spherical, right? So, um, but as t goes to minus infinity, it becomes very long and thin. Maybe something like this. Um, and so the ends here are kind of asymptotic to um, the bowl soliton, right? Uh, to the Witten black hole whatever you want to call it, um, to the two-dimensional translating solution. So it gets very long and thin, and particularly the isoparametric profile. So the i g tilde of t uh, goes to 0 you know, uniformly uh, as t goes to minus infinity. So in other words, if I take t sufficiently negative, uh, there exists, I mean, choose there, there exists some t naught, you know, probably very negative, uh, such that uh, the isoparametric profile of my arbitrary metric, g t naught, uh, sorry, g naught, um, um, is bigger than the isoparametric profile of this, of this sausage model for sufficiently negative time, so g tilde t naught. So that's uh, where it comes from. So I need this fact that the, the uh, isoparametric profile goes to zero kind of point wise, but also the fact that the, this factor here is getting large as t goes to minus infinity. Right? So that's saying it's, if you like, the, the curvature gets, gets large as t goes to minus. That's the curvature of these tips, corresponds to the maximum curvature. Um, yeah, so those two facts together tell me that they're. I can always find a time t naught where I get the initial inequality, and therefore uh, I get that um, i g t 
is greater than or equal to I G tilde T naught plus T or some T. Okay, uh, but now the if I look at the small a uh, condition, that tells me that the curvature of GT is less than or equal to this term that I've got here, the fact the coefficient of a squared, right? That was the expansion of the of the isoparent profile. When you expand the isoparent profile, this first term in front of a squared is just the maximum curvature. Uh, and so that's the bound. So the k is less than or equal to e to the minus two, and this time it would be uh, t naught plus t uh, cosh e to the minus two t naught plus t. Um, okay, so there's a beautiful estimate. So in particular, well, if you expand that out a little bit, that's exactly of the form we need. It's you can bound this by one plus uh, I think it's a half e to the minus four. Uh, T plus T naught. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's kind of incredible, right? So you've got a, a bound on the Gauss curvature, not only for all times, but it's actually decaying exponentially at some explicit rate, just e to the minus 4T to 1 as T goes to infinity. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so soup K decreases down to one. And now the rest of the argument is kind of trivial, right? So I've, the fact that I've got a curvature bound means the smoothing estimates give you bounds on all higher derivatives. And I can just use, uh, for example, just an in, a simple interpolation argument uh, to say that, um, you know, any, any derivative curvature is bounded by some constant times, either the, maybe at the expense of, uh, uh, so let's say four minus epsilon times t. But I, I get exponential decay of all these derivatives down to zero. Um, okay, uh, and that's it. That's that gives you really without any work the convergence of the metric to to a limit, um, so that g t converges in c infinity to g infinity. Uh, in fact, exponentially at a fixed rate, and with uh, k g infinity identically equal to one. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's that's the argument. I'll stop there, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben, for taking us through a very interesting alternative approach to the theory of uh, two-dimensional Ricci flow, so thank you. Uh, slightly longer than I thought. <laughs> well, it was clear you were having a lot of, lot of fun doing it, so <laughs> I didn't want to disturb you. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions for Ben? How, um, what are the chances that these ideas could be maybe applied in higher dimensions? <laughs> yeah, um, there's sort of some hints that bits of this work in three dimensions. Um, so you don't have a gauss bonnet on, on the three dimensional manifold, but you do have gauss bonnet which would apply on the boundary surface, for example. And that gives you part of this story. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't think, well, you know, I certainly haven't been able to see a way to put it all together, but uh, it, it might be that you can get at least some partial result along these directions in three dimensions using isoparametric ideas. Um, yeah, uh, Paul and I thought about that a little bit. We didn't didn't manage to get it work yet, but there's sort of some nice hints there. Have this you, is higher than that. I don't think I, I can't see but, any way to get it to work. But what if, uh, so suppose in three dimensions, what if you have like a one dimensional symmetry and then everything reduces to some flow in, 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 oh, a, in a, on yeah. a surface? Yeah. Would, sure, if you made some uh, assumptions like that, it could work. Do you expect this like similar techniques? Like how special is it that we have rigid flow apart from regularity, oh. you know? Uh, uh, it even in two dimensions, be... this is very special to rigid flow. Right, right. So, uh, right. I, I need, in particular, in the time derivative, uh, I needed the time derivative area to be integral to Gauss curvature so that I could apply gauss Monet. If you just modify that a little bit. So for example, in, in two dimensions, there's another family of flows where you could flow by a, a power of Gauss curvature. Right? And that's a nice parabolic flow, but none of this works. Right, right. So. No, but I'm thinking perhaps you know, in higher dimensions, if you have some symmetry and it reduces to a flow on the sphere, yeah, and then that, maybe the flow is like known. Ricci flow plus, you know, Yeah, that's quite term. possible, right? Uh, like yeah. All right, cool.
Hmm. Any further comments or questions? All right, well then let's uh, let's thank Ben again for taking us through three three big talks in our seminar series. All right, thanks. Well, thanks very much for that, Ben. It was great to have you speaking with us. All right, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, Maybe we should thank Tim uh, for organizing well and, and the other organizers, but mainly Tim for for the initiative, right? And for yeah, thanks. Taking care of everything. Interesting series. So thanks, yeah. Tim. Um, I'm glad you're all enjoying. Well, thanks, <laughs> thanks for the the honor. It was um, I, I think it's quite quite a good thing for us to do to be able to connect as geometric analysis analysis across Australia. So, thanks all for for helping this helping make this work out. Uh, it's unclear what we'll be doing next time. We haven't got any speakers lined up, but watch this space and we'll email you all telling you what happens next time. Thanks all, I hope you enjoy uh, your weekends. <laughs>